Good morning and welcome back to school, welcome to uh, Connect University. Connect University, that is, as you know, the flagship initiative of DG Connect, so the Commission's Director General for uh, Information, uh, Communications, Networks, Content and uh, Technology, um, to bring topics that are very topical and very important in the digital domain closer to the staff, but also to everyone else who is interested, so to you. So thank you for joining us. Today we have prepared a topic that is not both Today, we prepared a topic for you that is uh, very important and currently also very high on the agenda and developing very fast, which is cyber awareness, cyber resilience, and cyber security. With, and we are particularly glad about that, with a particular focus on Ukraine. And of course, it's no coincidence that we want to discuss this topic uh, today with you. Um, as you know, it is, or it rather has been October, that is European Cyber Security Month. So we will be able to look back a bit at the activities and the lessons learned from this year's Cybersecurity Month. Now, already when the coronavirus pandemic hit Europe and the world and everyone in teleworking, we realized how vulnerable our ICT infrastructures are. We have seen a huge increase in attacks um, in recent years, including in critical infrastructures. Think about the hospitals. Uh, and we have also seen that awareness and resilience starts with everyone of us. Because we are all becoming more and more dependent on uh, connected technology, uh, so the cyber ecosystem has been expanding at a rapid speed, and so cybersecurity became a crucial concern for all of us and for the European Union as a whole. Uh, cyber risks are nowadays at the at the top of global threats worldwide, so it's also at the top of the EU's priorities. It's a priority in which the EU has been investing for years already, while at the same time we must not become complacent. Just a few days ago, there was the European Council, and in the conclusions, uh, member states were invited to enhance the resilience um, of critical infrastructure and advance uh, the implementation of our new NIST tool directive. So a lot to discuss uh, this morning. Um, and of course, uh, with Russia's terrible, cruel, and of course, an always illegitimate war of aggression against Ukraine and the Ukrainian people, the topic became even more relevant. Protection of critical infrastructure from physical attacks, but also cyber threats, is part of Ukraine's uh, brave defense day by day, and has also become uh, increasingly important uh, a topic for the, uh, for the European Union and, and the Commission. So while there's a lot of uh, support for Ukraine by the EU, there's also a lot that the EU can learn from Ukraine and the experiences uh, of uh, Ukrainian experts in the field. So we are very privileged that uh, this morning we can hear first hand from Alexander Piotr, Piotr, the Deputy Chief of this State Service of Special Communications and Information Protection of Ukraine, SSS CIP. Good morning, Mr. Potti. Can you hear us? I hope you can hear us. So, Mr. Potti will, in a few minutes or a few good moments. Morning. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Mr. Potti will tell us a bit uh, about the cyber attacks that Ukraine has experienced and describe how the Ukrainian authorities equip themselves uh, to be able to respond to them. And we also speak um, about the Ukrainian cybersecurity education system, how to educate the growing number of specialists that are needed, and how to certify their knowledge and skills. And then following Mr. Potti's presentation, we'll have a debate, which I'm personally looking very forward. So we have the privilege to discuss this morning with Lorena, works uh, Alonso, the DG's uh, Director for Digital Society, Trust and Cybersecurity, and with Johannes Passa, the Executive Director of Elisa, the U.S. Cybersecurity Agency. Morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, Lorena and uh, Johan will then be able to shed some light on, on of course, what the EU is doing and uh, how we are working on resilience and uh, what we're doing um, on, on, on cybersecurity expertise, skills, and, of course, share some lessons from the Cyber Month. So now um, a few housekeeping announcements before we kick it off. Please connect via Slido. Like that, you'll be able to send us questions. And of course, we will make sure to put your questions uh, to the speakers. Uh, for those not yet connected, please do so now and use the code hashtag cyberresilience. Then, of course, please also make waves about our debate on social media. You can use the hashtags hashtag ConnectUniversity and hashtag CyberSecMonth. You can also log into our Fitpurium platform, join the Connect University community there, and leave us comments there. And uh, now, without further ado, we have about an hour and 30 minutes until 11.30. You don't need to take notes because this session will be available 
on the YouTube channel of Digital EU. So now, time uh, to kick it off. Time to hear from our guest, uh, Alexander Potti. As I said, Alexander Potti is the Deputy Chief of the Ukrainian State Service of Special Communications and Information Protection. Mr. Potti, good morning. How are you this morning? Good morning. Thank you very much. It's nice. And uh, let me short uh, interviews. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Europe Union and our people, your people, for support Ukraine in this hard time. This is uh, very important for Ukraine and for Ukrainian people. And uh, I represent uh, IIPSIP. This is a uh, basic institution who is responsible uh, in Ukraine for cybersecurity, security in information infrastructure, critical infrastructure, and uh, information security, technical information security, and cryptograph, uh, uh, cryptograph uh, technology in Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, I would like to return our themes uh, today. Uh, you can see my, uh, you see my presentation, yes? Yes, indeed. And we're looking yes. forward to a hearing so, presentation, indeed. Yeah. So I will start. Uh, before I move to the uh, main topic of our discussion, let me first define the term of cyber resilience and explain how it correlates with the such term as cyber security and cyber protection. And most importantly, what is the difference between them? Uh, in my opinion, the conceptual difference in these terms, especially when we use uh, them together, as follows. Cybersecurity refers to a state or condition. Cyber defense or cyber protection, for example, is a, an act or process and activity and cyber resilience is an ability or capability. This is the most principle for difference. On this slide, I allowed uh, myself to demonstrate three definitions of this phenomena in order to better highlight this difference. And finally, I take a liberty of offering you an integrated definition that would help us to comply, combine all three phenomena under one clear logical umbrella. Granted, this is a simplified approach, but at least it would help us greatly to focus on the cyber uh, subject matter. So, as we can clearly see it here, cyber resilience is first and the foremost an ability or capability, while the ability itself could be described as a set of organizational, logistical, and social system. Also, for the system to be efficient, it is extremely important to have enough actors to be instrumentally involved. This slide illustrates some of the actors being involved in cyber resilience. As you can see, these actors could be both individual professional, companies, corporate structure, government, regulators, and so on. Thus, we can safely conclude that cyber resilience is a phenomenon has many faces. That's exactly why I pose the following question to all of us. Is it even possible to offer some universal approach in building such capability as cyber resilience? Can we find one single model of building up cyber resilience that would make all all the models, models and methodologies indeed redundant. I believe that the answer is obvious. Such universal model does not exist yet. In order to reach the relevant cyber resilience level, we can apply various models tailored to particular actors. In my opinion, the most important task today is to ensure cyber resilience of business and critical information infrastructure sites. Because it is the foundation, the cyber resilience of the whole country. To be cyber resilience, organization, you need to address multiple capabilities within your organization. A cyber resilient organization, company, business must answer positively to the following questions on this slide. This is very reminiscent of NIST 
cybersecurity framework, identify, protect, detect, respond, and restore our recovery. Really, we have a lot of different models of cyber resilience. For example, a systematic cyber resilience model. According to this model, an organization that has a systematic approach to cyber risk governance, culture of cyber hygiene, cyber risk management, and cyber crisis management strategies will be able to achieve systematic cyber preparedness and resilience. It is vital for the survival and thriving in our simultaneous times. There are more complicated models of cyber resilience for example, Civic Cyber Resilience Model. This model was delivered, uh, developed by Think Cyber, Think Resilience Initiative in the United Kingdom. This model introduced key strategic principle for Civic Cyber Resilient Organization, namely resilience by design. This model covers five broad themes and is subdivided by a set of key, key design principles. In Ukraine, we are formulating our own approach to cyber resilience right now. Let me give, uh, introduce this model. I call this house of cyber resilience. The roof of the cyber resilience of this house is represented by the cyber resilience stakeholders. Its column are the incident response teams at various level, national level, regional, sectoral level, and on-site. And uh, while the foundation of this house is comprised both of the security IT system and cyber security culture ecosystem. Now, let's review each of these components separately. The term stakeholders, Ukraine mains, government, NGOs, academia, private sector, and society at large. It's extremely important to ensure that all of them are properly engaged and play by the same rules. In order to achieve this, I suggest we use the effective engagement cycle. It's also important to define strategic goal, set engagement policy in place, and make sure that everyone understands clearly and complies with them. Of the end, of the, uh, at the end of the day, we need to build a space of trust between different uh, cybersecurity stakeholders. And it's a perfect task for government. We expect the private sector and academia to be proactive and constructive in ready to be their responsibility for efficient cyber resilience together with the government. Now, is to the columns of the house we are talking about the wide network of incident response teams. Ukraine's approach was as uh, that such teams should be operate at the national, regional, sectoral levels, as well as on site. Also, such teams could either belong to the government or municipality or be privately owned. It's critical for us to ensure that following. First, common rules of information exchange between different teams and trust. Second, common taxonomy of cyber incident. Third, common scale to measure the criticality of cyber incidents. And fourth, common approach to respond to them. All these components today are already available in Ukraine. As we speak, the what we are focusing on right now is to generate valuable practical hands-on experience. For example, we use uh, 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 common taxonomy from uh, Europe Union uh, institution in ESA, and we use common scale to measure from, uh, from United States CISA. And finally, the house how this foundation is comprised of cybersecurity culture ecosystem and security technology. To us in Ukraine, the term security technology means a combination of all security IT systems, networks, government information resource, 
industrial control system, IoT, etc. In order to ensure the proper level of security, Ukraine is currently using different methodology, risk management framework from NIST, ICMS from ISO, and another approaches. The second subcomponent of the foundation is cyber resilience culture ecosystem. Where it's important to have motivated workforce, knowledge, awareness, professional standardization, etc. The role of private sectors is critical in laying this foundation through the use of the, their training facilities, awareness programs, study tours, sharing best practices, building cybersecurity centers of excellence, etc. In my humble opinion, this is only, uh, only some of the aspects that describe the role of government and private and academia in building cyber resilience. So, we see that awareness in our model is an element of cyber culture. This slide illustrates basic component of cyber culture. I use security advisor uh, proposition. In order to develop an effective group of cyber culture model, organization must leverage an individual cybersecurity behavior model. Based on Fox research, the necessary components of individual behavioral model can be divided into three categories, motivation, ability, and not. An organization can control these variables for facilitate individual change in the employee's behavior. Pay attention, uh, pay attention to the ability element. Giving employees the right awareness and tools to help them perform their day-to-day -day task with ease is fundamental to forming an empowered cybersecurity culture. Awareness, education, development of skills to deal with adversaries and security protection technologies with the right policies all help employees to protect the company from cyber threats. If you consider the cybersecurity capacity maturity model for the nation from Global Cybersecurity Capacity Center, then building cybersecurity awareness is in the dimension three, building cybersecurity knowledge, knowledge and capabilities. Dimension three consists of building cybersecurity awareness, cybersecurity education, Cyber, cyber security professional training and cyber research and in, innovation. We see here that awareness is an important element of cyber security maturity of nation. In Ukraine, we are going to use CMM as a tool to assess the maturity of the, our country in cyber security sphere. Finally, a few words about cybersecurity projects and programs in Ukraine in the field of cyber resilience and cyber education. First of all, the most biggest task and project in Ukraine, this is implementation of cybersecurity strategy of Ukraine. This is the biggest effort in terms of the size, scale and resource you can see in this slide. Our president signed the action plan to the fulfill this strategy back in February 2022. So far, this action plan contains 94 practical tasks, 10 strategic goals, uh, which we implemented within the next five years. As a result, we have already involved 81 central government go uh, body agencies, 27 regional military civilian administration, hundreds of local self-government authorities, academia, and civil society in carrying out this action plan. The plan covers three main areas of cybersecurity divided into 10 strategic goals. Building cybersecurity resilience is an important area of our Ukraine's uh, our Cyber, strategy, uh, cyber security strategy, as you can see on this slide. And here we are implementing various projects in the field of awareness, cybersecurity awareness, and cybersecurity education. For example, holding 
and annual cybersecurity month in Ukraine is a task in the cybersecurity strategy of Ukraine. Ukraine has a well-developed system of formal cyber education. Today, we have two specialties in the state classifier of education. First, this is cybersecurity and information protection. And second, this is information security management. At the national level, we have adopted two educational standards, Master of Cybersecurity and Bachelor of Cybersecurity. Educational programs on cybersecurity are available in 52 universities in Ukraine. Annually, before the war, up to 100, 1,400 bachelor, bachelors and 500 masters of cybersecurity were trained of the Ukrainian universities. But there are also some problems. Firstly, many graduates don't have sufficient practical skills. Secondly, educational programs have, uh, have not kept peace, pace with the rapid development of cybersecurity technologies. And thirdly, the structure of the education doesn't correspond to the structure of the cybersecurity labor market and workforce development. So we have launched the project on establishing the system of professional cybersecurity certification. We are building the system using a template similar system, namely National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, NICE from USA, and European Cybersecurity Skill Framework from ENISA. 70 new cybersecurity professions were included into the state classificator of professions in 2021. While in 2022, we plan to approve six professional standards, first, then send more, and then open the National Qualification Center in 1923. This will allow us to start assigning new professional qualification in 2024. This project is aimed at forming a new workforce with the higher qualification requirements. Our goals is to build a national-wide professional education and training system. Its main elements will be, first, professional standards. Today we have six standards, and uh, in next year we have another seven standards. Second, a network of professional training center, cyber excellence center, and qualification centers. And third, a structured labor market. This will allow us to develop our cybersecurity workforce and provide greater resilience to cyber threats. So, finally, cyber resilience and cyber awareness a very important task in cybersecurity strategy of Ukraine. And today we have systematic approach to reach the cyber resilience pool uh, different uh, information security information system in Ukraine, cyber resilience, information uh, critical information infrastructure in Ukraine, and cyber resilience whole country. And second, very important task in our in our uh, practical work, build of cybersecurity education, formal cybersecurity education in different university and professional cybersecurity uh, education. Joint and uh, work together this education allow us develop of uh, work, uh, uh, develop, uh, develop workforce in Ukraine and high competition professionals. Thank you very much for your attention and I am ready to discuss different problem of cybersecurity education, education and cyber awareness for our uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Apoti. It was very interesting, very insightful. Uh, it also became evident how professionalized Ukraine is tackling uh, cyber uh, resilience, cyber security, um, also cyber defense in a way, and, and how important this skills dimension is. So I think a lot of food for thought for our discussion, and I would like maybe um, 
start uh, by asking, inviting uh, Lorena and Johan to react to your presentation. Um, maybe, um, Lorena, if we start with you, um, having listened to it, Mr. Poti, um, maybe you could say a few words how the EU is, is um, supporting Ukraine. This is also a question we just got on Slido, by the way. Um, also, what we can learn a bit from Ukraine and what are your reactions to what Mr. Poti has said. Thank you very much and, and thank you for, for inviting me to be here. Of course, this is an honor and and I'm always very impressed uh, uh, when I see Alexander in the in the same uh, uh, panel or in a conference because the first reaction you have when you listen to to a presentation like this one, but even more to how uh, Ukraine is coping uh, with the, the cyber attacks they have been suffer. I mean, they are suffering. Um, you wonder. I mean, what what support? I mean, they they. It, it's really. Uh, admiration that that I must say I have uh, uh, for how uh, cybersecurity is uh, really being dealt with in, in Ukraine. Um, but it, it is true that there is uh, this uh, ongoing cooperation and support uh, uh, with Ukraine. Uh, it started, in fact, even before the uh, before the, the aggression, the, the kinetic uh, aggression, uh, we were already in contact with the Ukrainian authorities uh, and, and this is an interesting uh, thing that happened, uh, that uh, you can see what are the needs before and after uh, a physical aggression. Uh, be because uh, at the beginning, eh, some people were thinking maybe um, there would be only cyber attacks and not a physical war. And then the needs are very much related to, as, as, as uh, Alexander was saying, resilience, uh, yeah. being ready. Then, when you're in a situation where there is already an aggression, the needs are, of course, completely different. Mm. And you are more talking about um, connectivity, about um, data, uh, saving it. So it's uh, it, it's uh, an interesting thing also to uh, to analyze. Uh, uh, we uh, have been, of course, coordinating with the with the, within the EU, the member states, and also uh, private industry on cooperation to support with uh, hardware, software, even technical expertise. Um, but again, I say they are really uh, very strong. Um, uh, I think something that was very important also was the attribution of the bias at attack. This is something that, from my point of view, is, uh, of course, supporting uh, the fact that uh, we were united uh, in the European Union and beyond uh, uh, on this attribution. Uh, we have uh, a cyber dialogue with Ukraine. We have cyber dialogues with a number of third countries, and, and Ukraine is one of them. And uh, recently, there was uh, one that was called in, in June last year. Now, in, in September, so only last month, uh, there was a cyber, cyber dialogue uh, together with the colleagues of EAS and, 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 and Ukraine. And uh, there was a lot. There were a lot of exchanges, of course, in ESA as well, you. Uh, we were all there, uh, and there were a lot of exchanges on, on capacity building, on, on information exchange of threats, uh, how we deal with this, situation awareness, so a number of, of cooperation. Uh, then, of course, you have a number of member states that have, on a bilateral level, also supported a lot and even signed uh, a number of uh, MOUs. Uh, and then I, I would say that uh, something uh, that is uh, that is important to to see is what what are the lessons learned um, that go much beyond uh, what would we do if we were in a similar situation. I think that there are lessons learned on many on many fields. Uh, one of them uh, mentioned uh, is resilience. Uh, suddenly, I think that in the European Union we are all much more aware of what could happen and what could be the implications. So uh, in terms of awareness about the need to be resilient, uh, I think that uh, this is a good lesson for us. Uh, this may have, uh, some people say that this may have had an impact on uh, the fact that, for example, the negotiations on NIS 2 uh, went so quickly. I mean, so people say, well, uh, people maybe are, I mean, member states were realizing that uh, there's no time to lose. Uh, also, on the fact that uh, yes, some days ago there was this uh, recommendation uh, proposed to the Council uh, on the protection of critical infrastructure, 
Well, there is a very, very important part on cybersecurity uh, with a whole description of the work that is uh, ongoing already on risk scenarios, uh, risk analysis, uh, and the fact that there is an invitation in this recommendation to even advance the implementation of the um, not only the NIS2, but uh, also the, the critical infrastructure directive. So this urgency, I think, is something that uh, I think certainly comes as a, as a lesson learned. Um, I would say that there are uh, also other angles of resilience that have been mentioned also by Alexander that uh, now are much more present, uh, and it's all this angle of crisis management. So this is not only about being ready uh, and having a, a, a culture uh, and identifying when something happens, but is being ready at EU level if something of large scale happens. Will we be ready? Do we know whom to call uh, and how to act? Uh, and this is something that uh, I think now uh, we are being more aware of. Uh, there were these council conclusions uh, uh, on, on the cyber posture so just some months ago, inviting uh, the Commission and Member States, the colleagues of EAS and ESA, uh, to carry a number of actions uh, that go very much in that direction. Like, for example, doing risk scenarios uh, in case something would happen. I mean, this is the first time ever uh, we have this type of inv invitation from, from the Council on, in, in the cybersecurity field. Uh, these uh, things that are now being put in the recommendation to having our blueprints uh, ready, up to date, uh, to have playbooks. So this is something that I think we will need to really be working uh, very strongly. <clears throat> uh, the fact that MIS2 uh, is uh, formalizing Cyclone, which is the network of cybersecurity agencies uh, to deal with large scale uh, incidents is something that is very positive, but also there, I think we will need to quickly uh, bring things into place. And, and uh, I must say that the Czech presidency is, is, is doing a lot of work in that sense. Uh, then other type of lessons learned. I think that we could write books uh, about uh, what we are still learning, because unfortunately things are ongoing. Uh, there have been many, uh, for example, uh, concepts uh, in law terms that are being uh, analyzed, like, for example, uh, in terms of attribution, what's the burden, what's the level of proof, in terms of uh, what's an act of war in cybersecurity, because of all the consequences that it can have, uh, in terms of what is an army in cybersecurity. I think that there was a lot of debate also about that. Uh, so there are many things that uh, we can learn from and that is shaking all our concepts. Uh, but something very important, and I'm going to finish with that, uh, that I think uh, we have learned is the importance of international cooperation, is the fact that when something big happens, we, we cannot survive alone, that we need to work among each other. And this means among each other member states, but also uh, with our like-minded partners. Uh, and this is why this type of dialogues and cooperation agreements are extremely important. But also, I would say something else is the importance of the private sector. I think that this, uh, in the situation we are living now, uh, we are all seeing how uh, the private sector is uh, really playing a very important role. And this is something that we, we need to analyze. We need to see how uh, uh, to involve them. Uh, we are on it, uh, uh, for example, and I, I, I don't know if uh, Johan will talk about it, uh, with this uh, program that we have now that was mentioned in the recommendation about a kind of uh, emergency fund or, or where uh, NISA is working with private companies uh, to support in case of, of, of need uh, and all the debate that we are having uh, around this, uh, which in a way is very much on how to involve the private sector also in support in case of large scale incident or in preparedness. So I'm going to leave it there because I think that, as I said, uh, we could Thank write you. a book <laughs> about it, uh, but I, I leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorena. So with this, I hand over to Jan, uh, Director of, of NISA, our cybersecurity agency. Yeah, you have now the chance to write to both Lorena and <laughs> Mr. Pot. Indeed. Thanks very much. It's an honor to be here and a pleasure also to see and hear what uh, uh, the Ukrainians have done. I think uh, if we look at the threat landscape now, also in the context of the Russia's war in Ukraine, uh, one thing which stands out is that um, 
although there haven't been very many spillovers, the uh, the scope of the attacks and the uh, sophistication of the attacks has really uh, grown. And in terms of threats, I mean, what we see in the European Union is that uh, the categories ha haven't really changed. So supply chain is a big problem. Um, ransomware and phishing and sphere phishing, big problems. But of course, we've seen also information manipulation, disinformation, espionage, cyber espionage uh, rising. And in, in this context, I think it's very important what Mr. Potti said, what is the foundation of cyber resilience, that it has a, a number of elements there, starting from awareness, cyber culture and cyber hygiene, ending in uh, developing the appropriate skills so you can actually counter uh, these threats. And I think that's uh, amazing to see that Ukraine is already using the European Cybersecurity Skills Framework, which was actually only developed this year. I wish all of our member states would do that. Me too. <laughs> so I think uh, having these 12 profiles clearly established, uh, having an understanding what kind of knowledge and expertise uh, these professionals um, uh, need to uh, have uh, really helps us also to tackle this one of the biggest issue of how to build resilience is that we have a gap of 300,000 cybersecurity professionals in Europe. And, uh, and this is something that we, we need to tackle not only here in Europe, but also together with our allies and partners. And of course, Ukraine is one of them. So I think that, that, that is one thing that within this context of the European Cybersecurity Month that is still ongoing, um, we need to remind ourselves that awareness is only one uh, block of the foundation, and it has a number of other blocks that are all necessary and needed in order for us to build our resilience. And I think, as Ukraine has proven, if you have the foundation right, even one woman or one man can be an army. And I think that's a very important lesson learned for, for, for all of us. The second issue is indeed what Lorena mentioned as well, is the partnership of uh, um, uh, private and public sector. And we've seen that also in the case of Ukraine and how this kind of partnership and network has really uh, uh, developed uh, the capabilities and the capacities that are necessary in order to increase resilience. Uh, so indeed, I mean, thanks for the very good help of, uh, of the Commission. And ITA is now setting in place a program whereby for each member state, uh, we try to partner up with cybersecurity service providers in order to roll out and expand our service catalog vis-a-vis -vis the member states when it comes to building resilience first. So a lot of uh, ex-ante stuff like uh, stress testing, pen testing, threat hunts, etc. Uh, but also being ready for the worst, which means that uh, should incidents happen, should cross-border incidents happen, we have partners who can help uh, uh, specific service, uh, critical service providers in the member states. And I think that's very important that we 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 build this network. And really one of the inspiration uh, was the, the, the case of Ukraine, where this uh, strong partnership between private and public entities have worked. My final point is actually that um, what we also seen and what we've learned uh, from Ukraine is that uh, this alliance and partnership cannot only be uh, in isolation. You need to have partners also outside of your borders in order to be efficient. And this is also one of the reasons why ENISA now, with the support of the Commission and External Action Service, is actually finalizing its cooperation framework with Ukraine, where we really try to, uh, and I have to stress that it's a, it's a two-way street, uh, because I think uh, we can learn quite a lot from, uh, from Ukraine. Of course, we can also help and assist them in their road to membership. Ukraine is a candidate country, but in terms of capacity building, knowledge and information, uh, we are we will be the receiving end of, uh, of this cooperation in this sense. And of course, Ukraine is not the sole uh, partner with, with whom we are now stabilizing and institutionalizing our uh, partnerships. It's also going to be NATO and CISA in the United States. So I'm very happy that the Commission has invited also NISA to participate in the US-EU cyber dialogue. So I think these three points, mm -hmm. skill, skills development in, in partnership with awareness raising, uh, 
networking and partnering up with private sector and then also looking beyond your own belly button, so to speak. Thank you very much indeed. We are getting uh, questions quite a lot, so many things, please keep on sending them in. So I would like to start maybe with questions from the audience. Uh, questions for both, I mean, uh, some for Mr. Putti, some for you. Um, I stay with you, Luan, for a minute. You mentioned cyber hygiene. Can you give us an example of cyber hygiene? That is something that I got via Slido. Maybe you can start with an easy one. I think um, when we talk about cyber hygiene, we have to look at the individual, but also organizational level. Uh, and I think it's very important that we uh, do this in, in this holistic manner. Um, we, and when it, when it comes to mandate of the ENISA, we are really, I think, uh, we should focus more on the organizational level because we, we need to ensure that there are frameworks in place to help organizations to behave in a, uh, let's say, cyber hygiene manner. Um, and the best uh, example, not only for organizations, but for, for societies, is the, actually the 5G toolbox. Mm -hmm. How do you know that the services, the components, the, the products that you use in order to provide your own services are solid? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the steps and actions that you can take in order to vet them, in order to make sure that uh, the producers have washed their hands before they... <laughs> they uh, cooked you a meal, so to speak. Um, so I think this is something um, we we should take as a, as a role model. And, and I'm very happy that Lorena mentioned the, the finalization of the NIS2 directive, which I hope will be finally adopted by the Council and Parliament, because I have 600,000 euros that I need to spend. <laughs> um, uh, that uh, the NIS2 uh, foresees uh, potential risk assessments in critical sectors. Uh, and I think these risk assessments really are the baseline of uh, contributing into a better cyber hygiene in these different sectors. Uh, uh, quite a lot like the the sectoral risk assessments that now connect together with us and other uh, EU bodies have undertaken for the for the most critical sectors. Uh, I think it's 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 an important step to actually Build the cyber hygiene, and you need to know where the germs are, so to speak, in order to make sure that you can combat them. Thank you very much. Um, Lorena, you have mentioned uh, the private sector in your um, in the remarks. So there was a question we just received. What is the most urgent recommendation to the private sector? Do you have something to, to respond to that? Well, I think that uh, since uh, the um, aggression, uh, both in ESA and you have been, uh, in fact, uh, doing a, a very good job of uh, distributing recommendations uh, precisely to companies of things that they should be doing that include cyber hygiene, uh, as, as we were saying. Uh, basically, when you look at the, at the requirement of NIS2, you have them all there. Uh, basically be compliant with all having a, a, a risk management uh, uh, strategy. Uh, I think that uh, Alexander mentioned them as well, uh, being able to identify that you have an incident, being able to react to that incident, being able to uh, recover, being able to notify it immediately to the, uh, to the authorities so that others can uh, learn from it. Uh, I mean, there are so many things. Um, I would say follow the advice of Enisa that is constantly uh, sending this, but in a way, I think that if all our companies uh, respect <laughs> the uh, legislation they are subject to, uh, they should be fine. Uh, uh, if they advance, by the way, needs to as well, that would be even better. Uh, but something also very important, I would say, which unfortunately is also uh, in NIST 2, which is not yet in force, uh, and that the Cyber Resilience Act will help too, is, and it was mentioned by Johan as well, right now, uh, one of the biggest uh, threats in companies are supply chain attacks, mm. uh, which is something I would say very unpleasant, because this means that even if you as a company are adopting all the hygiene measures you can, uh, there can be one of your providers uh, of a software, for example, that didn't. Mm. And then basically thousands of companies like you that are uh, clients of this provider can be affected. Uh, uh, this is why another measure that I think is very important to take is to be aware of with whom you are dealing. So to have also uh, 
supply chain uh, strategy so that you check well uh, what are you buying, what are the uh, components or elements that you are introducing whether in your processes or, or in your products uh, uh, so that this is also taken care of. Uh, unfortunately, the Cyber Resilience Act is not yet there in place. We, are, we, we will start negotiating it now uh, because precisely this is going to cover this so that uh, and to help companies in fulfilling this type of, of, of hygiene and, and requirements because every product that they will buy will have the C marking and then uh, will help in, in, in building cyber resilience. Thank you very much. Mr. Porte, we'd like to come um, back to you. We, had, uh, we have received some questions uh, um, more for you. I will take the liberty to group them a bit because they're quite, quite several. Um, so to start with, uh, how has the Russian aggression changed your cybersecurity strategy. Um, so, how did you adapt the strategy to the to the um, to the threats that came with it? And as a follow-up question, which part of the house of cybersecurity that you showed us is the most fragile part? Do you mute it? it seems. No? Sorry. Thank you very much for the question, and uh, thank you, Lorena, and thank you, Johan, for uh, your. Uh, discuss about uh, very important uh, things, hi hi uh, cyber hygiene, cyber culture, and uh, cooperation between private sector and uh, government sector. So uh, I I would like uh, some uh, something about uh, our discussion. Uh, first about private sector and small enterprise, for example. Lorena says uh, said very important uh, important thing that uh, private sector and small and uh, middle enterprise need uh, very good to understand cybersecurity uh, risk and uh, threats because for example uh, when we have in Ukraine we have a most powerful cyber attack not Petya uh, this cyber attack start with private sector and uh, uh, Hackers use uh, uh, supply chain for implement uh, malware in a different system. After this, uh, this uh, cyber incident uh, had escalated on different information, uh, different information, uh, information system. Not only private sector, but the government sector, financial sector, and not only Ukraine, but uh, another country. So. We, we see that uh, if uh, uh, middle enterprise, small enterprise company uh, from private sector don't use requirements for cybersecurity, this company uh, can, uh, can be uh, three, uh, uh, can be a source of uh, cyber threat and cyber risk. Very important. Uh, implement <coughs> cyber cyber requirements uh, and uh, uh, security requirements all of level of uh, of the state, private sector and government sector, and critical infrastructure. Uh, uh, I, uh, what about uh, cyber hygiene, cyber culture? In my opinion, cyber hygiene this is um, uh, most uh, more uh, individual characteristic for each. Uh, in, uh, each individuals of maybe uh, of level school uh, university students uh, old uh, men and women and uh, and so on but cyber cyber culture uh, is uh, organizational characteristic for employees and staff and uh, cyber hygiene uh, uh, a very wide uh, it consists a very a very wide rules for each citizen, how we use smartphone, how we uh, secure your smartphone, how we secure your uh, secure your uh, email, uh, uh, home computer, and so on. But cyber culture, this is organizational rules and behavior. How we use corporate email, uh, uh, corporate email, how we use corporate information system, and, and so on. This is a uh, small difference between cyber culture and cyber hygiene, but cyber hygiene is the uh, most component for cyber culture. And uh, 
a couple things about uh, cooperation between cyber uh, the government and in private sector. Uh, yes, after the um, after the uh, become the war and uh, aggression in Russia, uh, many uh, many professionals from uh, private sector. Uh, uh, was uh, was be uh, was mobilized in uh, AAASIP and another institution of uh, which is responsible for cyber security uh, cyber security task and uh, uh, this is uh, very important uh, for government because uh, private sector incorporate a new uh, professional culture uh, during the response of cyber attack uh, many uh, professionals work with military staff, to get, work together with military staff, and uh, today we have very intensive exchange experience, military staff and civilian staff, during the uh, uh, detect and respond and recovery, uh, detect and respond cyber attack and recover critical infrastructure. This is a good example, unfortunately, during the war. A good example cooperate between private sector academia and uh, and government sector especially for military for military sector so in future we uh, uh, we have strategy for build this uh, build a trust relationship between private academia and the NGO and the government very important task and very important thing build the trust we have a common rule for exchange information. Today, for example, uh, this common rule uh, approved a special uh, agreement between different uh, main body of cybersecurity, national cybersecurity system. And, uh, for example, in Ukraine legislation, we have basic basic requirement or basic rule that each uh, each uh, company. Uh, each government agencies uh, must uh, very quickly inform national com uh, national team of cyber response about cyber incident. We improved special taxonomy of cyber incident, and if, for example, small enterprise, medium enterprise, private sector, academia have incident of uh, network of uh, open information system. During the next uh, next hours, uh, this uh, object, uh, this site, uh, must be infor informed the uh, national response team about cyber incident. After this, we start a special procedure for uh, for uh, uh, respond to this incident. So today we implement uh, on national level wide national mechanism for very quickly detect cyber incident and cyber attack not only government sector but private sector academia ngo and so on today in national uh, uh, each citizen can uh, call to national response team uh, national response teams and inform about anything problem uh, to uh, anything problem about si si anything cyber problem. After this, we start a very quickly uh, process for response of this cyber incident, and maybe uh, this allow us uh, don't uh, 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 take special mechanism and not escalate cyber incident to cyber attack. And a very, uh, very important task and very important ex uh, uh, experience during the war and during the active cyber attack uh, and, uh, in uh, Ukrainian critical infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Potti. And it's very impressive. Um, also, this, this containment that you just described and you also described the networks. Uh, I think that's something that uh, Duan also spoke about uh, um, in more detail. Um, and of course, you yeah you answered very much the question on how the Russian aggression changed um, your strategy. So now looking um, at the EU, Johan, um, I mean we of course have a com comparably comfortable situation, of course, in the EU. But how can we make sure that we adapt without you know? Of course, we have this this threat to Ukraine, which is an indirect threat to to the EU as well. But how can we make sure that we stay on top and, and you know um, 
yeah, of the changing threat landscape, which changes, I suppose, more quickly than, than we can probably react to it now. So it's... <clears throat> Uh, I do remember whether it was uh, General Eisenhower who said that um, uh, plans are important, but planning is essential, mm -hmm. uh, which means that whenever you build something, you must be ready to actually rebuild it and then rebuild it and rebuild it. Um, I think there are a number of steps that uh, we need to take, and one of them was actually taken by the Commission just last week of um, targeting uh, uh, an understanding and awareness of where are our vulnerabilities when it comes to the most critical sectors. We've seen acts of sabotage that are not cyber sabotage, but the physical sabotage against our critical infrastructure in energy, in transport, in telecommunications. Um, what does it mean in terms of uh, our ability to make sure that the services are resilient to such kind of physical sabotage as well, which has, of course, a cyber element because it will uh, uh, disrupt the digital services um, to an extent as well. Mm. Um, so uh, being agile, being able to direct the resources, but also efforts uh, to, uh, to, to the most critical focal point is one of the, one of the things that we need to be able to do, uh, which means that even though we have annual work programs, we need to be able to adjust these annual work programs when when time calls. Um, but the second issue, I think, is also a more long term. Um, so there are short term things and more long term things. And especially when it comes to uh, capabilities in technology and in industry, I think, uh, and I'm very pleased to uh, share together with Laura, Lorena the seat in the European Cybersecurity Competence Center. When we are now building up the, the programs and the priorities, I think. From my point of view, uh, the the big bulk of the of the financial resources that the centre will coordinate should go into long term capacity development, technological and industrial capacity development. Um, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to short term stuff, we can we can deal with it. But I think we we should never forget that there is there are also long term trends, and we need to tackle these as well in parallel, like. And again, I just refer back to the, the amazing resilience of the Ukrainian society. Um, they need to tackle with the war. It's imminent, it's there. But at the same time, they also tackle the fact that they are a candidate of the EU. They look at the long-term perspective. And I think both are important. You can't just do what is now, because if you do it now, you will already be too late for to, to confront the future. You need to do both. And I think in this sense, in, in cybersecurity, when we, when we talk about cyber resilience and, and capacity building, we also need to do both. And I'm very happy that we now have the center to actually look at the long-term things. And one of the long-term things that I, of course, constantly brag about because it's um, the, the next year is the European Year of Skills is the skills development. And how can we use the different the cybersecurity skills framework that we built and partner up with private sector and academia and the industry in order to build work streams that build skills uh, and capable, uh, skillful experts uh, that Europe needs uh, in the long term. And I think it's a huge challenge. So I think that's something that uh, really needs to undertake. It's a good keyword because I was actually about to come to that because I was, was also very prominent in, in Mr. Potti's uh, presentation. Lorena, if you if you look at skills and this, if you look at capacity building also from a human perspective, and, and you mentioned it, the European Year of Skills is, is 2023, um, also very relevant in this in this domain. What are the plans of the Commission? What what are we working on? Well, uh, first of all, I think that, that there are a number of things that uh, have been done. Um, but I would say uh, there are many that still need to be done. Uh, and uh, something that I, I think is very, very frustrating, and I, I have to say, because I don't want to say, but I was very shocked yesterday looking at the news in, in, in Spain, the daily news now. There was, um, uh, they were interviewing uh, people from Ukraine that are now living in Spain. And there was this person that was working in a bar, washing dishes, and uh, he was asked, so how are you doing? And he said, well, I'm trying to learn this job, because I've never done that. I've never worked in a bar. In fact, I'm a cybersecurity expert, mm. that, but my title is not recognized here. 
And I, I was so sad to hear that because I know the shortage in my country, <laughs> like in every uh, country in the European Union, I would say in the world of cybersecurity skills. And I know the competence of cybersecurity experts from Ukraine. So I was, uh, I was very sad to hear that. So all the uh, things that uh, Yuhan was mentioning before, uh, and also Alexander on, 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 on the need to have a number of standards and certification, if possible, at least at national level, some, some uh, commonality and recognition is extremely important. So this being said, because I had to say, because I was, I was very sad to watch the news and, and to see that. Um, uh, I think that we are at the moment where there is uh, no matching between the needs and the offer. I am optimistic that this will be solved. Uh, I think it's a matter of, of, of time because the needs are increasing so much that it's impossible that there will be no reaction. So now there are a number of activities that have been taken place already in the European Union. I mean, uh, we have the, uh, we created uh, for the first time ever the, in the Digital Europe program, which is this uh, financing program for the deployment of technologies. Uh, uh, you have a whole section uh, of funding dedicated to uh, specialties in, in technology, and one of them is, is cybersecurity. So now we are already applying this for the first time. We, are, we, we, we just selected a number of projects where you have a number of universities uh, working together to develop uh, master degrees, etc. Uh, we have uh, also an, an, a rewire, which is a, an Erasmus Plus uh, 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 funding uh, on, on cyber, of the digital skills and jobs platform, a platform to do matching uh, between skills and, 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 and jobs, all the ENISA work that uh, Johan has already mentioned, EXO, which is uh, uh, the European Cybersecurity Organization, with all the private companies also. Uh, working on that. So there are a number of, of activities. I think that what we need now, uh, and I want to believe that because we are still working on it, is what uh, our president had in mind, um, uh, is to put some order here and to put it, to bring coherence, uh, because of course it's much better if you uh, bring together all the activities that are happening uh, so that they are not duplication, so that one reinforces each other. And, uh, and you have all the angles covered, not only the need for some kind of uh, certification, but uh, also that you have the private sector working very closely with, uh, with uh, universities, with, uh, with schools to, to, to make sure that you don't have this mismatch. Uh, um, and uh, I think the idea would be, I mean, it has been called a, a, a cyber skills academy. Uh, but I think that it, there's a lot of bringing coherence uh, and a single point of contact where all the activities can be, can be carried. Uh, very important also, and it was mentioned by Alexander, it's not only about having the skills, it's about practicing. It's about being able to put them into practice as soon as possible. And this is why uh, the Digital Your Program also deals with that part, so that uh, you have via whether it's the digital innovation hubs or the, or the national competence centers in the context of the network competence center that we can bring also the private and uh, the students together so, so that they can practice them. Uh, but something I want to conclude with uh, is that uh, all these new pieces of legislation we are adopting, so NIST 2, that is hiring up the level of requirements to, 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 to companies and to the public administration. But now the Cyber Resilience Act that is coming with a number of requirements uh, for manufacturers and, and distributors. Uh, we are getting a lot of, oh my God, but uh, where are we going to get the skills? In fact, this type of legislation is going to create a huge demand and this is going to trigger uh, universities, schools uh, to uh, push in offering these skills uh, because for a very long time uh, we are noticing that companies has not, have not been investing enough and in public administration, by the way, in cybersecurity uh, for many reasons. Uh, now there will be no choice. Mm. Basically, there will be no choice. Our companies and our public administration 
will need to invest in cybersecurity and will need to have people that are able uh, to put in place of this system. So the demand is going to uh, be now very, very, very mandatory, let's say. Uh, so I want to believe that this is going to trigger and that we are in this period of mismatch, but that little by little, and you see already the figures uh, evolving. The, the gap is, is is smaller than before. And speaking of the, of the skills, I was blessed to see the number of graduates. You have like over 2,000 a year, Mr. Putin, you know, in Ukraine, uh, taking together bachelor and master's uh, that you showed us in your presentation. Um, coming back to you, um, Mr. Putin, um, I had earlier asked about uh, a question from, from our audience. Um, which part of the house is the most fragile? And there was another one, uh, which of the 10 strategic goals is the easiest one to implement? So maybe you want to, want to share uh, your insights there. And I had another question for an example of nudging, this word, really of one of the three dimensions that you showed with your visual. So maybe you want to capture these three questions uh, all together. Thank you for question. So first uh, about uh, cyber, uh, house of cyber resilience. So, uh, the most uh, uh, we have um, uh, is, uh, is our experience, we have uh, some, uh, something that uh, that uh, not uh, hard. The first, this is cooperation between stakeholders of the rule, because uh, when different stakeholders have different strategic goals and different uh, understanding what is cyber security, what is cyber resilience, and so on, these stakeholders a very hard, very hard, uh, very hard, co uh, very difficult cooperation. So this is our first task in uh, realization cyber strategy, cyber strategy uh, implement a very good instrument and very good mechanism cooperation between different stakeholders NGO private sector academia government and so on the second uh, not hard uh, place in this house uh, really cyber cyber culture and cyber hygiene because many uh, many people don't know about Cybersecurity threats, cybersecurity risk. Don't use uh, simple uh, security rules in the uh, task, uh, in the day-to-day -day practice. Uh, many company and uh, many government agencies don't realize requirement for uh, security standards, standardization, and don't realize special function for detect incident response and so on. And uh, we today we have not sufficient cybersecurity maturity. So um, maybe, I mean, in my opinion, today we have, uh, we have only one or maybe two uh, first or second level maturity. But for a good result, we have a third, uh, third level maturity of cybersecurity of nation. This is, uh, this is uh, our, uh, our problem. Uh, so, but, when we approved the cyber security strategy, we use uh, we use uh, good experience from uh, our uh, partner from EU. We use uh, recommendation from uh, very uh, high institution, uh, for example, ENISA, uh, NIST, and CISA. And uh, in cyber security strategy, we have a special task for building cyber security. Uh, awareness, cybersecurity education, and cybersecurity resilience. And today uh, we have only uh, uh, first result for uh, for realization of cybersecurity strategy uh, because we uh, uh, this uh, strategy start uh, on only half uh, first uh, six months, uh, and unfortunately. Uh, in February, February we have uh, start uh, become a uh, Russian aggression and full in invasion to Ukraine, and uh, we realize this task more slowly uh, that we we want. But we have a good result result in in this uh, condition, 
and uh, we hope in and uh, end this year we uh, we get a first good result on different uh, sphere uh, and different uh, direction of cyber strategy this is cyber defense and cyber uh, resilience and uh, uh, cyber uh, communication uh, uh, in ukraine uh, so maybe this is the most important thing uh, in your question thank you very much and could we maybe have a concrete example of the nudging i just that people can understand what we mean with that term or maybe uh you want you want to give an example no <laughs> okay um Time is passing by rather quickly, so I would maybe uh, think we do a last round, um, if, if that's fine with you, uh, because we also have not yet tackled the Cybersecurity Month, which is the month in which we're doing this, which is also uh, maybe the reason we do this now. Um, so I wondered whether we could maybe look back a bit and see, I mean, it's a particular year with this with this uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine. Uh, Johan, uh, Lorena, maybe Tell us a bit what happened and, and whether there are some takeaways already and of course anything else that you would like to to uh, to highlight that you haven't had a chance yet to say so first of all i just realized i have to uh, raise my own awareness about uh, terminology because I, I have no clue what nudging means <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, clearly a uh, uh, need for some homeschooling um all right um i think there have been some interesting uh, observations that we, we, we can draw. Uh, and one of them, of course, is the raise of uh, activists. Um, uh, private parties who align themselves uh, either with the aggressor, uh, Russia, or those who support Ukraine. Um, because, of course, for, for if, you, if you look at the European uh, framework, we've seen that uh, uh, clearly, illegal uh, activities, uh, which are not, uh, you know, activism is not something that uh, European directives uh, uh, propose to to undertake. Um, so how we will deal with this in the future? Is is this a phenomenon which stays? Uh, I mean, we've seen, of course, uh, private actors who are affiliated with sovereign. Uh, interests before as well, but on this scale that hasn't happened before. Um, so that's something that we need to, and uh, and, and, and I, I think links up very well with the debate that we had today is like, uh, um, how do you make a difference between ethical hackers and those who use their skills and expertise for malicious purposes in this sense as well then, in this much more muddled world that we now have. So that that's been an, um, kind of a thing. Then we 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 also seen that uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, as Lorena said in the beginning as well, uh, in times of uh, war, kinetic attack is sometimes easier to uh, produce result than uh, cyber attack, and we've seen how how this has played out as well. Um, then the other, and I, I come to that as well, I mean, the part of the resilience that we've said so many times, and, and, and I think that's a very good lesson to learn also for us in the future, um, that uh, we, we need to take the kind of a whole society approach also in cybersecurity. It's not only about uh, the CISOs in your company, it's, it's even not about the managers in your company or the experts. It's everybody, every one of us should understand just like we know the the rules for for traffic when we when we go to the streets, we should have the basic knowledge of cybersecurity, which is ingrained into us already from the kindergarten, from our parents. Uh, it's part of this kind of digital life skill package that uh, that we should have. If we have a digital society and digital economy, everybody should have a clear understanding. Also, what are the basic rules of the game when it comes to um, cyber security. So I think that's that's something that um, I'd like to highlight. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, very similar. I think that two, two big takeaways is one, uh, and I really like the way uh, Alexander put, uh, put it, which is uh, how 
the interaction of the different actors is essential. So that this is not only about companies, this is not only about government, and within the government is not only about civil or military, it's both. Uh, but all this is also about involving also academia and NGOs. Uh, so these four actors, that's something I really take away from what from what he said, uh, because it's very much what, what what we are seeing. We need everybody, and we need all angles covered, uh, uh, and we are trying to tackle all. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and there is often the debate, okay, what's first, what's more urgent, uh, and it's difficult to to disentangle of this because of course we need to protect critical infrastructures, and we are trying to legislate there with the needs to uh, with the uh, critical entities directive. Uh, uh, we need to cover also the products, uh, okay, Cyber Resilience Act, because. Uh, you can uh, adopt all measures you want as a company uh, that if the products you are buying are not cyber secure, well, what are you going to do? So you need both, uh, but also you cannot take uh, cyber hygiene measures or uh, have a proper crisis management uh, program in your company or in your administration if you don't have experts. Um, so you need the skills as well. So you, you need uh, to put infrastructure, you need to put products, uh, you need the people with the skills to do all these. Uh, uh, you need uh, crisis management beyond your own company, so <laughs> at state and even EU level. Uh, but there is something that was mentioned, and of course I have to mention it because that's the whole purpose of this debate, which is awareness. And uh, that's difficult. Uh, Johan was mentioning about school. I mean, let's teach it as we teach uh, all the basic things. Um, I think that all efforts are good and should be there. Uh, the EU cyber mode campaign is, of course, one of them. <clears throat> there to strengthen the resilience of, of EU systems and, and services and, and, and to really enable citizens to, to act as I mean, effective uh, human firewalls. Uh, so, um, and in this edition, uh, the edition of 2022, uh, the, the objective is to reach uh, professionals between uh, 40 and 60 uh, years old. It's a very, very important uh, uh, part of our, of our lives uh, uh, from all sectors of, of the economy, but in particular from SMEs. Um, and uh, it is intended uh, to uh, for, for European business communities as a whole, but also for, for the people that uh, whose work depends on, on all these digital technologies and tools. So uh, I take advantage that is my last intervention to push everybody to participate in, in this campaign and to thank all the colleagues uh, uh, that are working on it. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Lorena. Then I would like to give the last word uh, to Mr. Poti. Uh, back to Kiev. I mean, we have had uh, an impressive presentation by you, but maybe you have some uh, lessons or some some recommendations from from your side uh, to the to the European Union. But also, we have had this question in the chat on how uh, could you help uh, you to reinforce the cyber resilience. Maybe you have some I don't know some support you would you would wish to receive that you could share with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> first, uh, maybe for help uh, for you, Europe Union. Uh, the first, uh, this is our experience and our analytic information, uh, which uh, main goals uh, aggressor uh, take uh, for cybersecurity attack of Ukraine. Uh, I uh, read uh, five main goals during the cyber war. The first, and uh, these goals uh, take uh, uh, will uh, will be used uh, against uh, European Union country. The first goals: the collect information about public sector, private sector, about ordinary citizen every day, constantly. Uh, we have uh, incident uh, about collect information about this object. The second, destroy the information infrastructure. What is destroyed? This is implement while while a special uh, while we're a code, and uh, 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 and uh, in, in different uh, special information and destroy information infrastructure, delete information, and so on. Third, 
destabilize the situation in the country, spread panic and chaos during, uh, between uh, citizens, and uh, uh, distrust in the authorities among the citizens. The next, the next main goal during the cyber war. Uh, next goal, cause or humanitarian disaster affecting civilians, and finally achieve the political ambition of the Russian government uh, in Ukraine and European Union. For example, especially they are trying to hinder the European integration in Ukraine. You know that uh, cyber attack used for impl impact of, for example, uh, uh, election and so on. This is uh, information you can use uh, as a recommendation for build uh, cyber security strategy and cyber security instrument in Euro Europe Union. But another, more, uh, more positively, uh, things uh, uh, when yeah, I would like to say about this uh, during the discussion. So, uh, Lorena say, said that, uh, for example, that uh, cybersecurity professional uh, not effective use in, uh, in, uh, in a different country in the Ukraine too. But in my opinion, very task, very important task today uh, for all of the country, not only Ukraine, but uh, European country, country, is form uh, market or cyber services. If you, if you have very good market cyber security services, our specialists always find a good work and give your experience for a common cyberspace. Uh, common security cyberspace. Thank you very much for this discussion. Uh, thank you. Take over. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So this brings us then uh, to the end of our debate uh, this morning. A very interesting, very insightful, very topical. I would like to to thank you, Mr. Poti, Alexander Poti, the Deputy Chief of the State Service of Special Communications and Information Protection of Ukraine. Uh, Lorena Box Alonso, the Director for Digital Society, Trust and Cybersecurity in DG Connect, and Bjorn Passar, the Executive Director of the NISA, the US Cybersecurity Agency. Thank you so much for your time, for sharing your insights with us. Thank you all for your active participation and your interest uh, this morning. Uh, the recording will be available from next week on the Digital EU YouTube channel. And Connect University will soon be back with new sessions, then on for example, the Code of Practice on Disinformation, the Cyber Resilience Act, we have discussed it a bit this, uh, this morning, and the Metaverse. So, more to come on our Futurium platform. Uh, stay tuned. For today, let me wish you all the good and uh, safe uh, Tuesday. And uh, maybe allow me to close with a thought for all those who are uh, in the front line and, and who fight uh, the Russian aggression in the cyberspace and, of course, on the ground every day. Slava Ukraine. Thank you.